Why is it important to regularly analyze our test results? Well, this links back to our quality requirements, validity and reliability, and how we know if our tests measure what we think they measure. And of course, whether our tests can reliably chart student learning. In online learning, we are given detailed test result analyses throughout the course run. And because we have data from thousands of learners, we can see the impact of good or bad test questions rapidly. And then we can make some timely changes. So if the course quiz has a very high failure rate, we investigate. But what are the consequences if we don't? Well, in online education, that's threefold. First, lower quality courses give the whole institution lower ratings. Second, assessment is less valuable as it's not serving its purpose. And third, some of the students drop out after taking a quiz that they don't like, which leads to a waste of time and money for them and us. On campus, the same behavior does happen, except that we don't know about it. There's no visibility into this issue. Unless students complain, you probably won't find out that there's a problem. And if you don't see the problem, it'll always be there. It'll just never be resolved. This is the elephant in the room. So today, we're going to look at how to address this. And we do it in three stages. First, we input the data for analysis using software. And in this course, we kind of prefer to use Excel. We will then interpret, look at what the data says, and look at the context. Next, we're going to identify the cause of any problems that we found. So what should we be measuring? Is it enough to look at the final grade? Well, no. We'll be returning again to examining our learning objectives. Because if your students do not reach your learning objectives, there's a gap in their education. And this causes problems when the student continues their education and other courses that have built on yours. For example, if the teacher for a foundational maths course doesn't test the students properly, all of the other lecturers who rely on students knowing foundational maths have a problem and they waste time having to reteach students things that they thought they should know before. It's therefore important to analyze that all the learning objectives are being examined properly. So, how do we do this? Well, first we break the exams or assignments into individual components. For exams, these are the questions or sub-questions. And for assignments or projects, they are the criteria or sub-criteria. So this could be about independence or writing style or whatever. Please keep this differentiation in mind because we're going to be using a different approach for exams and assignments. And we do this because the items that elicit a response or an action from the student are different in these two types. For exams, the students answer questions, but for assignments or projects, they need to do something specific to meet certain criteria. So this is what the data for an exam would look like if broken down per question or item. You see the questions have been divided across the different learning objectives. You'll also see the maximum score that's attainable. Pause now to take a bit of a closer look. When analyzing exams or assignments, there are three levels of analysis. At the assessment level, we explore reliability of the whole test and examine the histogram of the grades. At the second level, which is the item level, we explore the maximum average and correlation. And at the third level of analysis, we look at the option or answer level, where we look at the quality of the distractors and the correlation between them. We also explore the frequency of mistakes. After inputting our data into an Excel spreadsheet, we can now see the full and colorful picture here. If you pause, you'll notice a lot of strange values. At the bottom, we have the p-value, and then up here, we have the RIT value, and even higher still, we have the Kronbach alpha. Don't worry, I'm going to explain these shortly. But when conducting an analysis of an assessment at item level, the p-value is particularly helpful as it shows the difficulty of the questions. For multiple choice questions, the p-value shows how often the student got the question right. Or for open and essay type questions, it's the average of the score from that time divided by the total. The range is from 0 to 1. If it's too high, it's too easy. If it's too low, it's too hard. Ideally, the p-value should be more than the probability of just guessing the answer correctly, which is 1 divided by the number of options. Thus, for multiple choice questions with four options, students have a 25% chance of just guessing the right score, 
For true and false, it's 50%. Pause the video now and see if you can spot any issues with the graph related to the p-value. Again, it's the one at the bottom. What are possible causes of the question being too easy? It could be that your distractors, or the wrong answers, are too obvious. If it's too hard, it could be related to how you taught the content, or the phrasing of the question and options are ambiguous. When you're writing your POC, we want you to consider why your own questions might be too easy or too difficult as part of how you interpret the result analysis. For those of you statistically inclined, here is the p-value. For our next value, a shows the quality of distractors. If you recall our anatomy of a question, a distractor is a wrong answer. If your distractor attracts less than 12%, it's too weak. The p-value plus the a-value should equal 100. Again, if you want to see the calculations for this one, here they are. Next, we come to the RIT, which can be simplified as the correlation between how well a student does throughout the whole exam and how well they do for this particular exam question. For any well-developed test, there should be some students who do really well and some students who do badly, and a large majority should be somewhere in the middle. The discrimination index correlates the score for a question with the total score, that is, the RIT. This calculation then lets you differentiate between the good performing students and the poor performing students per test item. High positive values with the RIT show that the item discriminates well. Negative values, however, mean that poor performing students performed unexpectedly well, or good performing students did unexpectedly badly in this particular question. If the RIT value is close to zero, then there's no discrimination, which means that all the students could get the question right. And that might mean that the question is too easy. So let's look at our example again. Can you see any negative values? If so, what does this mean? Students who should be able to do well on question one, for instance, failed. And students who should be doing poorly had passed. Or it indicates that there's something wrong with the question or with the test. However, this value is only an indication. For more accurate results, we can do a more accurate calculation, namely, the Ruhr value, which is an adjusted correlation. See, there's only sometimes issues with the RIT, but often issues with Ruhr. What accounts for this? To calculate the RIT value, we correlate the total that the student obtained for the test with the score for question one, or any other question, to see how well that score for question one can predict the student's grade. Then, we calculate the Ruhr value by subtracting the score for question one from the total and we recalculate the correlation. In this way, you can see more accurately if each individual question can discriminate between good and bad students. So to recap again, the multiple choice question with a low Ruhr or RIT might indicate that the answer key or model answer is wrong or that there might be two right answers. However, always consider the combination of the P, Ruhr and RIT value together. So before we do an activity, keep in mind the following. For closed-ended questions, the p-value should be higher than for the score they would get if they were just guessing. For open-ended questions, the Ruhr value will be higher than for closed-ended questions. Why? Because there's less guessing when students have to answer open-ended questions. They can still guess in a multiple choice question, but for open-ended, if they don't know the answer, they'll either write nothing or they're gonna write complete rubbish. So now let's look at the Kronbach Alpha score. This measures the reliability and consistency. But note, this score is only useful for big classes and tests with lots of questions. It measures the internal consistency, i.e. whether all students do equally well on all tests. Basically, it's a measurement of measurement error, or the theoretical error margin of how reliable the grade is. So what might cause internal consistency to be too low it could be too few questions, so it cannot measure properly. Or one group of students might be underperforming. For example, if you have accounting and economics students in the same class taking a compulsory accounting course, the economics students are likely to fare much worse because it is not in their field of interest. So use the rule of thumb listed above with caution. A high level for alpha might mean that the items in the test are highly correlated. However, Alpha is also sensitive to the number of items in a test. 
So a large number of items will result in a larger ELFR and a smaller number of items in a smaller ELFR. If ELFR is high, this may mean redundant questions, i.e. they're asking the same thing. A low value for an ELFR might mean that there aren't enough questions in the test. Adding more relevant questions can increase your ELFR. We'll be looking at an example now using what you've learned to analyze the test. Talk about the p-values, the writ value, and the ruhr value. What does this tell us about this exam? Come up with a few more explanations, and we're going to discuss this in class. Thank you again.